I think we should kick off our Academic Freedom webinar. Uh, I'm your chair, I'm Don Driscoll, and um, I'll tell you a bit more about me in a minute, but first I'd like to begin by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. Um, we pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Now I'm coming to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people um, and uh, I, if our chat box was functioning I would invite you to, um, to share where you're coming from but that won't be possible today because I think our chat is disabled. Uh, <clears throat> so first I, I want to start by introducing our, our three panellists, me included, uh, and then um, w each of us will give a bit of a, uh, an outline of um, some of the things that we think are important, so important issues about academic freedom, uh, and then we'll come to questions. We've had some questions posted already, which we'll, we'll address first, and um, we certainly invite uh, people at, at the webinar to post their questions in the Q&A, so you can, yep. Yeah, if any questions spring to mind, pop them in the Q&A and we'll hopefully have time to come to those afterwards. Um, so let me do some introductions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the Director of the Centre for Integrative Ecology at Deakin University and I've got research interests spanning fire ecology, um, frog conservation and diseases, invasive plant and animal species, habitat loss and fragmentation. And it's, uh, it's because I have this broad interest in conservation that I'm also really interested in science suppression um, because I've had um, personal experience as well as um, spoken to a whole range of uh, ecologists and researchers at various meetings who have told me about how they've you know got this uh, important knowledge about impacts on the environment but they're not able to share that and that really uh, undermines our democracy fundamentally. Uh, so that inspired me to um, lead the Ecological Society of Australia's Academic Freedom Working Group and to um, undertake the survey which is now published and freely available in Conservation Letters. Um, we also today have with us Professor Robin Bartell. Uh, Robin will wave. Oh no, she won't wave. She may be frozen. Oh no, here she comes. Robin is um, Professor of Geography at the University of New England. Uh, she has expertise in the intersections between environmental regulation and policy, natural resource management and placemaking. Uh, Robin has a multidisciplinary background in law, science and higher education and she's published on the importance of advancing academic freedom in the face of recent incursions and regressions. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we're all familiar with the, some of the motivations behind those incursions and regressions over the past few years. Uh, and Robin has a strong interest in strengthening the capacity of collective academic freedom beyond institutional boundaries. So we're very pleased to have Robin here. We've also got uh, Professor Adrian Stone. Now, Adrian is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and uh, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. She's a Melbourne Laureate Professor and Director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies at the Melbourne Law School. Now she's an expert in constitutional law and constitutional theory and has particular expertise in freedom of speech and academic freedom. She's written uh, books on the subject, um, so including the Oxford Handbook on Freedom of Speech and another book, Open Minds, Academic Freedom and Freedom of Speech from um, last year. She's the current president of the International Association of Constitutional Law. So welcome to uh, Robin and Adrian. So I'm going to start by giving some background in particular, um, talking a bit about what came, some of the issues that came up in the uh, ESA's survey. So I'm just gonna share my screen and uh, give a quick introduction. Um, and can I convince it to change? Yeah, so, they, so with the Ecological Society, we ran a, a survey and that uh, managed to elicit 220 uh, respondents. And that's now 
as I've mentioned, is published in, uh, in uh, Conservation Letters. It's open access, so you can go online and grab that for free. And essentially, we, we looked at uh, constraints on public commentary uh, and issues around that in university settings, in government uh, and in industry. And we found some interesting differences among those three different uh, workplaces. Um, but today, we're going to bring our focus to academic freedom within universities. So we can see that um, constraints on public commentary are, are prevalent in universities, um, even though they're much higher in government and in industry. And within those workplaces, um, people think that the constraints on public communication are excessive um, and st uh, still to a, at a relatively high proportion, you know, even in university, 16% of our respondents said that constraints were excessive. So there's still work to do in academic freedom in universities, even though they're not as bad as in government or industry. So the kinds of suppression that, uh, that we were reported is things like undue modification of your work by your organisation or being prohibited from speaking publicly about areas in which you're an expert. And again, you can see this general trend of uh, lower uh, results, lower uh, impacts in universities, but uh, not zero and uh, in, in institutions that, uh, that have a academic freedom policies, this is surprising. So the kinds of topics that were suppressed are of a, a, a real concern. So these are things like threatened species, clearing native vegetation, mining, urban development, uh, feral animals, logging and climate change. So a whole range of topics that are uh, essentially you know, amounting to existential threats uh, are, being, are being suppressed. So it's not surprising that we see in the latest uh, State of the Environment report that things are continuing on the same downwards trajectory that they have been over past decades. So there are a range of things that constrain uh, conservation and ecologists' uh, contributions to the media. And these are summarised here. So interestingly for university researchers, there was a fear of being drawn between, beyond their expertise or fear of the media or uncertainty about their expertise. So this was a, a main concern amongst university researchers, but a whole range of other things as well, including um, fear of losing research funding, particularly in universities, but also uh, people declined to comment in areas in which they're expert uh, because they are worried about promotion or even losing their jobs. There's also pressure coming in from uh, the minister's office as well as a whole range of levels of management, particularly for uh, if you're working government, but uh, interestingly, even in universities, the minister's office, uh, pressures coming from the minister's office uh, discourages university academics from making public commentary. And these, all these impacts on public commentary uh, and constraints have consequences. So they have consequences for our, the success of our society in general. So policy doesn't have the right data getting put into it to develop proper, uh, well-informed policy. Policy makers are uninformed and public debate is uninformed. And that means that um, basically people are being kept in the dark, which means they can't exercise their democratic right um, to vote for people based on uh, their performance. There's also personal consequences and that includes personal suffering and um, job satisfaction can be affected. In fact, 42% uh, of uh, respondents had been criticised for their open, um, for their past communications. And of those, 83% said their harassers were motivated by political or economic interests. So that's, a, um, that's where this, hmm, that's the motivation for attempting to suppress uh, free, free communication of science in ecology and conservation, because if people know how bad our polit politicians or some companies are treating the environment, uh, they might not buy their products or vote for them. So academic freedom in universities. So we've seen that violations do occur 
in universities, but they're less extensive than in government or industry. Uh, things like fear of the media and of placing a job at, at risk or not getting a promotion or risking your funding uh, are some of the reasons why people in academia don't uh, speak out when they are entitled to. And there's a range of consequences from including personal well-being is compromised and public policy uh, is compromised. So because of these sorts of questions, these sorts of issues, uh, Robin and I put together a, a PhD research um, opportunity funded by the Ecological Society of Australia. And um, the details can be accessed on that website or you can probably Google it in other ways as well. But the, you know, the fundamental basis of it is that, you know, we know that academic freedom is, is enshrined in legislation and universities have these academic freedom policies. Um, but our survey shows that academic freedom is still being violated and science is being suppressed, particularly in this um, realm of conservation and ecology. So some critical questions to answer. What are, the, what are the weaknesses of current academic freedom approaches in universities? Why are we still seeing these violations of academic freedom when there's academic freedom in legislation and policy? And why are academics still fe feeling pressured to stay silent in public good research fields like ecology and conservation? So these aren't the sorts of things that ecologists and conservation biologists would speak out about aren't um, you know, they have no commercial value. They're not commercial in confidence issues, which um, can be brought to bear in to, to uh, stop researchers talking about their research results. In conservation ecology, it's public good uh, research that people are entitled uh, to find out about because, uh, the, you know, in general, their taxes are paid for it. Another question, how should university policy change to strengthen academic freedom? So uh, Robin and I want to run this PhD project to really focus on how can we improve um, academic freedom policies to try to fill the gaps that are still allowing this kind of um, suppression to happen. So that's, that's uh, my brief intro. And now uh, Robin, I'm going to hand over to Robin. She has a a couple of slides that she'd like to talk to. So please go ahead. Thank you so much, Don. And um, I would like to um, thank you and the Ecological Society of Australia for providing the opportunity. Thanks in particular to Grace at ESA and also to AGN for joining our panel. I would like to um, issue acknowledgements to country and pay my respects to the Anirwan, who are the custodians of the country in which I live um, and responsibilities are shared also with Gambanga, Gamilaroi and Dungati. I would also like to thank the Institute of Australian Geographers and the University of New England Academic Board Academic Freedom Working Group for providing opportunities to pursue these sorts of questions. I am a geographer and I work in environmental law and policy, which of course is never contentious. Um, but my interest in writing this particular paper was to respond to concerns about attacks on academic freedom, including an earlier round of interference in ARC funding decisions which of course cuts off the pipeline at the source. This is not just about suppressing existing findings, but suppressing the answering of questions and even the posing of questions. We were also responding to um, authoritarian regimes and issues with academic publishing. However, in looking at these issues, I found there was a general lack of appreciation of what it was we were attempting to protect as academic freedom is not always that well understood. And I think disciplinary boundaries are working against us a bit here because it's an area of knowledge that sort of belongs to everyone and therefore no one. And it also seems to be overlooked in what passes for apprenticeship into the academy as a student. So I first needed to identify what it was and what it wasn't. Um, and especially as some were uncritically picking up literature from the US, which is inapplicable in Australia, particularly with regard to freedom of speech, which it should never be completed. So I was looking to the history of the concept and was particularly attracted by the, comp, you know, the composite conceptualizations of the freedom as encompassing individual academic freedom, collective academic freedom and self-governance, autonomy and necessary state support. 
And I'm now working on a follow-up article exploring the connections with collegiality and collegiate decision-making. And here I'm gonna be particularly drawing upon the UNESCO 1997 recommendation with the status of higher ed personnel. And it explicitly states that academic freedom is conditional upon collegiality and describes collegiality as the higher order principle as it is inclusive of academic freedom, shared responsibility and participation in decision-making. And it identifies that the core purpose of these concepts is to enable the pursuit of new knowledge and the public good and particularly in the service of global understanding, cooperation, human rights, peace, sustainable development and the environment. So I was starting to work on this and what do you know, there was another incursion in ARC funding decisions. Could I have the next slide please, Don? So this time it was the Robert Six following hot on the heels of the Birmingham 11 and even earlier the Nelson Six. And I'm particularly interested now to see how universities are responding to such interference both of this acute type, but also the more chronic kind, such as the harnessing of universities to serve a narrow economic agenda. We see the influence of new public management and market models imposed and complicitly adopted, which are really corrosive. And I'm not looking, however, to any some sort of imagined perfect past, far from it. I think universities have legacy issues from their role in the colonial and imperial project, and associated dispossession, theft, appropriation, and epistemicide. So entire areas of knowledge have been disregarded and some folk have been denied access. And academic freedom is sometimes described as being about protecting heretics, and this is certainly part of it. But a question remains to me, for me is who gets to be a heretic in the first place? And beyond removing constraints, what we can do to provide supports and enablers. And this is an increasingly political and ideological battle and we have seen state interference in terms of manufactured free speech crises on campus when the real crisis, as French found in his 2019 review, is to academic freedom. However, and in flagrant disregard of autonomy and French's own recommendation, we have an effectively mandatory model code for speech and academic freedom now, which all universities must subscribe, and also a legislative definition, which I think actually would be fine if it was great, but I think it is actually sorely deficient. Um, I think it reduces shared freedoms so that institutions are responsible for curriculum decisions rather than academics. At the same time, it ignores autonomy and state support and the scope of extramural utterances are expanded. So now the critique of the sector and higher education policy is beyond scope and one can only critique the host institution in addition to expression within one's areas of expertise. And I think what makes this all the more concerning and, um, and the only real threat to academic freedom that French actually found in his review was in the last place we should expect it to be, in university policies themselves and particularly codes of conduct. These may limit the exercise of academic freedom under the guise of requiring respectful and in this context read amenable or even crucial behaviour. And I think that obviously these are um, potentially able to be weaponized against academics. The last dot point here um, and that concern refers to the erosion of collegiality arising from unjustified differential treatment of colleagues. And one kind of fun fact outcome of restrictive codes of conduct is that students may technically have more academic freedom than academics and not be maybe widely aware of this, of course. Which leads me to my solution slide, please, Don. It's the last slide. Given, um, um, is it not coming? Here it is. Oh, Richard, there it is. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that given the lack of appreciation generally about academic freedom and its value, the first step is awareness raising and then advocacy for reform. Obviously, we need our version of the UK Haldane principle, not only to um, stop interventions in research funding allocations, but reverting back to the original report, which was also about evidence-based policy. We also need to amend the definition and university policies where they have chilling effects. And in the meantime, I think we can advocate for beyond compliance practice. So act as if the standards in the law are the minimum, which we, with, which we can exceed in our behaviors. Similarly, we can do better than new public management. We should have new public governance, which is really not new at all for universities. We have long had a shared governance arrangement, but they may be observed in name only and need to be made more meaningful. And we do need to ensure that we have inclusive institutions 
And just as a quick kind of sidebar, I do see parallels between regression of environmental law and regression of academic freedom. And one area which I think we really need to arrest is the business model mania for many reasons, but also strategically. I think that if we are seen as businesses, then the public will trust us like businesses, i.e. not much at all. And then we will be funded less and less as there will be little politically, political currency electorally for universities. If on the other hand, we build public trust through demonstrated value proposition in serving the public good, then we are more likely to survive in order to continue to serve. Thank you very much. That's the end of the PowerPoint, I think. Thanks, Robin. Now, uh, I'll just stop that sharing. Um, and so, yeah, just a reminder to the audience, if you've got any questions, pop them in the, in the Q&A and I'll come to those. Uh, and while you're thinking of your questions, uh, let's go to Adrian. Okay, hello, thank you very much. Um, for having me here today. Thank you to Robin and Don for this invitation, lovely invitation. Um, I am, you know, somewhat in um, out of my natural habitat, I would say, as an academic lawyer and social scientist. Uh, but one of the joys of working on academic freedom is that it has brought me into contact uh, with people from across the disciplines, and I have learned so much I look forward to doing today. So before I go on, allow me to acknowledge, first of all, the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work and do most of my work about academic freedom, but also to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from the traditional lands of the Darawal and Durga peoples. Um, now, let me just perhaps step back and say uh, why it is that I'm working on academic freedom, because the way I got involved in this is a little bit different, I think, because I'm not a scientist. I'm have been for most of my academic career a constitutional lawyer with specialist interests in freedom of speech. Now one thing that really began to happen over this last five to ten years is that I'm constantly consulted about issues uh, that are taken to be issues of freedom of speech but which occurred to me were not really well characterized in that way and these were typically controversies that were happening on campuses of various kinds. And the controversy around uh, Professor Peter Weird, which is, I, I won't go into the detail of yet, um, was exactly one of these controversies. It seemed to me that they're not well characterised as freedom of speech controversies, but rather as academic freedom controversies, and that there is a really different, there is a difference between the two principles. So my initial foray into the debate was actually to argue for uh, a disentanglement of the ideas of freedom of speech on the one hand and academic freedom on the other. But as I became more and more involved in the work, I've actually become very interested in what I call the constitutional dimensions of academic freedom. So a little more of that later, but that's how I came to work on this. So let me say the first thing I want to do is to disentangle academic freedom and freedom of speech a little bit. So let me talk about that and then I'll move on. So what is academic freedom? Let's just start with that. Um, I mean, I take it to be uh, the, the basic proposition that um, academics and some other people engaged in teaching and research are to be free from undue interference in the way that pursue that teaching and research. That as a general rule, academic disciplines are to be self-governing. And so it is academics within the discipline that determine what good research is and not external forces. Okay. Teaching, uh, research and teaching are absolutely at the heart of academic freedom. But I also want to know that we need to pay attention, note, note that we need to pay attention to the institutional context and we need to structure the way universities um, exist so that they have sufficient autonomy in order to provide the kind of environments in which academic freedom can foster, can, can flourish. Now, academic freedom is generally um, regarded to cover research and teaching, publication, but also because of the need to have an environment in which academic freedom can flourish, it is generally understood to cover criticism of university governance by those who are also engaged in teaching and research. 
And that is a particularly important aspect, I think, of academic freedom for us to protect. Now, in terms of rationales for, free, for academic freedom, um, the obvious one that I think would no doubt appear, no doubt appear um, immediately to all of you who are working scientists is that knowledge is a public good. That when we understand the world better, we live better. And of course the scientists and the sciences and especially a science like ecology seems to me to provide us with very, very significant direct material benefits. But I would argue that um, a, a full defense of academic freedom needs to be able to account for the value of other disciplines. Um, and in part of my work, I have focused upon what I take to be the value of the social sciences and the value of the humanities, which I think en enable us to organize our societies better and to understand in the first place what a good life is, right? So it seems to me that, that, that there is a strong case to be made across the disciplines that um, advancing knowledge through research and teaching is itself a public good. But I also want to say that it's a democratic good. And here is where my I as a constitutionalist comes into play. In my view, in, um, at, uh, universities are really important parts of the democratic infrastructure. They enable government in complex societies which need reliable information if they are going to pursue public, uh, um, uh, complex public policy goals. And they are a very important way of having an independent and reliable source of information that enables the citizenry to hold governments to account. And I think we need to focus a lot on this democratic rationale. And I absolutely agree with what has been said before, uh, that um, academic uh, freedom needs to be better justified in the public mind. So I would want to justify, to um, focus um, the public mind, first of all, on the public benefits of research, but also on the democratic benefits of research. And just to offer a, a sort of global and comparative perspective, it is no accident in those societies in the world where democracy is now receding, that universities are at the forefront of attacks by rising authoritarian governments. And so we ought to regard in some senses universities as the canary in the coal mine and to be keeping a very close eye on them for the health of our democracy. Let me say something um, next, uh, just to contrast academic freedom with freedom of speech. I also think that's an important value. It's an important value in universities. Freedom of speech is a civil or political right that all of us hold as citizens. And it applies to much activity on campus that is the extension of politics in the, in the world at large. So as you all know, all kinds of activity happens on campuses that is an extension of ordinary public discussion and politics. And in relation to those, we have freedom of speech, but academic freedom is a distinct principle that protects the unique social role of universities in disseminating knowledge through teaching and research. I think if we separate them, we can understand them better. And I think by, by clarifying the nature of academic freedom, we can argue more effectively for its adequate protection. I've really almost said enough, but let me say something about limits and about uh, contemporary threats. When it comes to limitations on freedom of speech, of free academic freedom, it should not be thought that academic freedom is sort of some kind of privilege that gives academics a free for all to do whatever they want, right? The really important thing to understand is of course that um, academic inquiry pursues knowledge in distinctive ways through disciplines which contain their own methods and standards and ways of determining good research from bad research. And they are also subject to ethical requirements and all of those constrain us as academic researchers. And we're also at least somewhat constrained to um, act uh, within a realm that I think is plausibly related to their expertise. So academic freedom gives me no entitlement whatsoever to um, uh, a pine on ecology. However, um, uh, the legal regulation of the environment might be an area in which I have got quite a lot to say, or at least my colleagues who are environmental lawyers do. Lastly, let's turn to contemporary threats. A lot has been said very eloquently already, and I agree with all of it. Um, I do not think that the principal threat to academic freedom arises from small bands of 
fairly powerless left-wing students on campus who can, of course, be very intolerant, as can uh, people of other political persuasions. And where that happens, I think we need to deal with it. But there are much deeper and more structural problems. In my view, Australian universities are too dependent on attracting outside sources of funds, which renders them vulnerable to outside influence, whether it's from the commercial world, foreign governments, or political institutes like the Menzies Centre, which has just been founded at my university, which actually seems not to be too problematic, but raises um, questions. Um, I think that um, there is a tendency in the public mind to value universities for their economic contribution, which is significant and important, but I do think we need, um, and if we want universities to be properly protected, we need to stress their public benefits and their democratic benefits. Um, and I think we should absolutely be up in arms about the kind of ad hoc political interference that we have seen in the ARC process to which Robin referred. And I should say that it's principally, not only, but it's principally been the humanities which have been subject to this. And it arises from a tendency to trivialise research in the humanities. Um, and it arises from what I think is a populist suspicion of expertise. And I think that is a political, um, a strand of political thought that we must absolutely resist for the health of our research and also for the health of our democracy. So let me leave it there so we can open it up for discussion. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, it's a, a wonderful uh, introduction and coverage of some of the big, big issues in academic freedom. Um, can I, oh, so while oh, you've still got your, um, your engine running there, can I ask you to, if there was anything else you want to talk about in terms of the difference between um, freedom of speech and academic freedom, or Robin, I don't know if you had some ideas on that as well. Just, I think you covered it pretty pretty well, Adrian, but that, that was one of our questions. Well, so, so one of the things that I, I, I would just say briefly um, is that you've got to remember that um, not all, that academic freedom in some ways broader, not all academic work is, is explicitly expressive. So, you know, the kind of work that's archival work and uh, field work and experimental work is not obviously expressive and it's just an ill fit for freedom of speech. Um, but um, uh, secondly, I think the protection of academic freedom in universities should be, should be even stronger than the protection for freedom of speech. Because if, for example, we were to put a restriction on, the, on freedom of speech on campus, for example, we might say, look, we just don't think that, you know, this particularly um, disreputable group is entitled to hire a university wall and spread their disreputable views. They can still go elsewhere, right? They can still go to the steps of Parliament House and do it. We're all we're saying is you can't kind of conscript the prestige of the university <laughs> in support of your ideas. But when we're talking about, you know, it's really only in universities that you get research that is both comprehensive and independent and done by experts in accordance with disciplinary norms. That's really what we have to protect more than anything else. And we have to resist the idea that all we are is a forum for the politics of the society at large. We're something much more distinct and special. And that's what I wanna focus on. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you also touched on the, the one of the early questions that came in um, before the webinar started, which was about limits to academic freedom. Um, and so the, the person who asked this question said, I'm interested to know if the panelists feel that there are ever limits to academic freedom. That is, do individuals have the right to say and publish whatever they choose, regardless of the situation? And do senior administrators retain this right, even when acting in an official capacity as representatives of their organisation? Can I just jump in and say, I think academic freedom applies to teaching and research. Mm. It doesn't apply to whatever academics want to do. It applies to teaching and research. It doesn't apply to a senior administrator insofar as that person is not engaged in teaching and research. Yeah. Uh, Robin, did you have anything to add on that one? I think that um, in terms of actually the constraints, I think sometimes we talk about the constraints and the responsibilities of um, people who are exercising their academic freedom, you know, it can be sort of conceptualized almost as like a, as a, a, as a constraint. 
But I also think they're equally enablers because they're actually furthering the achievement of the purpose, which is the contribution to the public good. Because I do think it is about generating knowledge for betterment. And I think that includes knowledge for knowledge sake. It doesn't have to have an instrumental or utilitarian outcome. Knowledge for knowledge sake is equally a public good. And I think that in order to actually um, fully achieve and give life to that purpose, we have scholarly and ethical standards. And we exercise those and implement those according to academic judgment. So I can, for example, you know, make up anything I like, but unless it's actually been adjudicated upon by peer review that, that what I have actually said is sound, is of value, is it is actually extending and contributing to knowledge, that is actually enabling the achievement of the purpose. So I see it rather than a, as a constraint as an enabler. So that was just a first um, point. So absolutely, these are the, the standards to which we set ourselves. No freedom is absolute and whether we characterize it as a principle or a right or any of those other types of, of um, categorizations, there are going to be those, um, those sort of standards to which we wish to um to meet those standards otherwise we're actually not going to be achieving the purpose either and i do think that um, in some senses thinking about when we are actually exercising our expertise and who is actually exercising expertise and for what purpose i think that is really critical because if one is actually representing an institution for an institutional um, sectoral based uh, activity that is not actually the, the core area of teaching research knowledge generation and sharing and that as a separate activity altogether. And I think that this is where I think we do need to talk about what it is um, we are talking about with great clarity and um, with great sort of um, precision, because otherwise everything gets conflated with everything else and thinking about when actually we are exercising expertise and for what purpose because otherwise I do think we are in a sense um, devaluing the currency of what it is that we are contributing um, and ensuring that it is specifically applied to those areas where it is furthering that purpose. Um, because we do see, and I think Adrian, you touched on it too, this kind of general sort of um, decline in trust of expertise and decline in trust of institutions that are actually trying to further um, you know, the public good and it may be we've been too successful, right, as, as academics. We've all been questioning grand narratives and showing that we've all got feet of clay. But I think that it is actually in that exercise that we are providing the public, you know, value to our, um, to what it is that we are doing. So that value really needs to be um, promoted, I think, more and, and also more collectively. I'm wondering why, you know, we've, we've got um, the Australian Association of University Professors, we've got Public Universities Australia, we've got Learned Academies. I think it's wonderful to see that the discussion starting now, um, and I really think it is really timely that these organisations are furthering that agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And just to give a, a, a sort of example on limits to academic freedom, you know, within ecology, you know, people will talk about their, their area of expertise and that's variously defined. Um, but you can't talk about, you can't talk about everything uh, because you don't know about everything. So um, the general rule is, you know, you can talk about your area of expertise and make sure you're right when you talk about it. <laughs> make sure it's based on the evidence. Uh, that's a, a key rule of thumb. Um, another question uh, that was sent in was about, um, academic freedom around the world. So the, the article um, that I put out with the ESA was, uh, gave some examples from Canada and Australia, but I just wanted to, so in, in, in answering this question, I uh, did a bit of Googling. So I'm just gonna share my screen again and um, give you a bit of an overview of global academic freedom, if we can. Let's see, here it comes. So this is the Academic Freedom Index from 2021. And uh, bluish colours are countries with, uh, who scored higher on the Academic Freedom Index and the browner countries are those that scored lower. So you can see that we've yeah, now got this really valuable 
uh, international tool for understanding the state of play and academic freedom around the world. And you'll also notice that, yeah, it suggests that you know, although, you know, that there are big issues with academic freedom in Australia, we're still, um, actually, we're just outside the top 20% of, um, of countries. So our, our score is just under 0 0.8, I think, in the detail from, from this report. But you can see countries, uh, China, Egypt, Syria is in there, all with really low scores, um, Cambodia. So, yeah, so there are, although, so, although um, I'll complain a lot about academic freedom issues in Australia, uh, there are countries that are much, much worse. So things like, you know, universities get closed down and people get arrested and disappeared um, over uh, when, when they express their, their academic freedom. So yeah, although things are bad in Australia, they could be much worse. Um, but things are getting worse globally. So this is from that same report showing trends. They're not as bad as they were in the 60s and 70s yet. This is the average global trend adjusted for population size. Uh, things got better for quite a long time and have taken a turn for the worse. And they noted that this is um, coincident with the rise of um, populist and autocratic leaders. So. Um, think Russia, think Trump, think China, think, yeah, a range of um, non-democratic aspects to um, the way different co countries are governed. And this one sh just shows some of the, the big changes. So below the line here, so this is academic freedom 2021 versus academic freedom in 2011. And those countries below the line are ones that have got worse. So you can see Brazil way down here with its... Um, a yeah, big shift in in um, style of government uh, recently reversed. Hong Kong, of course, had big changes. Uh, Russia, Hungary, Poland, so a whole range of countries that have been going backwards uh, over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, Could so, I just jump in and say something on on that, Don? Yeah, certainly. So one thing that attracts my interest as a constitutionalist is that there are. Um, many places in the world um, that because of their, their long experience with authoritarianism have chosen to make academic freedom and constitutional principle. So that um, in Germany, for example, under the basic law, um, the freedom of arts and sciences and of teaching is given the same protection as freedom of speech. And I think that reflects their experience, of course, during the period of rising authoritarian in the Ethereanism in the 30s that the capture of universities was really important. Mm. Uh, so that is one way for us to go, is actually to think more about academic freedom as one of those fundamental constitutional principles that makes our society work. And then think about how we institutionalize that. That's kind of stuff that I do, right? That's my sort of area of research, interest and expertise. Um, but I think there is, there's a lot to be said there about it. Yep. Uh... Let's move on. We've got uh, we've got a total of ten questions. We've dealt with three of them, so we have to speed up a little. Um, fourth question: Could it be argued that allowing climate change denialism is a form of academic freedom, given the current climate crisis and the calls from many quarters to limit the airtime given to climate deniers? What do the panelists feel about this? Do academic freedoms only apply to issues or belief systems supported by science? Uh, and Robin, do you want to lead on that one? I think, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that we've covered it to a certain degree in terms of actually identifying that, um, you know, academic, what is, what counts as, you know, quality um, and what counts as good and what counts as knowledge is to be determined by academics themselves. And that is key to academic freedom. It's key to the um, institution of the enablers and or constraints, um, depending on how you wish to look at them as scholarly and ethical standards. And I think the institution of those and the constant testing of those is critical to ensure that the, the knowledge that we are contributing and generating is of value. And we know that knowledge is always um, con contingent, contextual, contested. That is actually part of um, the value proposition of the knowledge that we genera generate. So I think that, um, in a, in a sense, this is, this is absolutely key. I think that if we do have academics enabled to actually implement the standards, 
and to provide their arguments and to provide those in um, in an in an open way, then we probably should be able to ex, you know achieve our purpose more effectively and have those standards more widely appreciated and the, and the value proposition of exercising those more widely appreciated and understood. Yep. Uh, anything to add, Robin? Uh, Adrian? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the point to make is that science has its way. It has its own ways within its disciplines for dealing with controversies over climate science. And that academic freedom is really saying, let the scientists work it out. That's the best way that we get to a reliable conclusion. Mm. What you don't do, for example, as was done in the Reid case, is rely upon a university code of conduct, which requires something like civility to silence somebody because their views on climate science are heretical. You use the science and that's the best and most reliable way and protects all of us for the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if I can use a footy, football analogy, you always play, play the ball, not the person. Um, and I think looking to the substance of the arguments is critical. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's another question about uh, invasive species related suppression of academics. For example, my experience with feral horse management. So just very briefly, yeah, that's a, it's just a really good case of um, science suppression, but not so much from a, well, not to, I'm not aware of examples of suppression within universities in this regard, although our survey results suggest feral animals was an area where academics are, are suppressed. So if you're an academic and you've been suppressed over talking about feral animals, please contact me because I'll be interested. But yeah, certainly that my input is from um, uh, yeah people working in national parks in New South Wales, for example, who are totally forbidden from saying anything publicly about feral horses to the extent that I went to the, a meeting, uh, a research development meeting with some people from um, the New South Wales government present. One was a, a sort of topic expert and another turned out to be essentially his media minder. And um, they, they exchanged those sort of awkward glances between each other when they were veering towards having to say feral horse. Um, and they steered away from it. They, neither of them said the word horse or feral horse throughout this meeting because it was deemed to be too sensitive. So it's just extreme suppression uh, in New South Wales. Uh, on the horse issue, but yeah, that, that's all I want to say about that. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, this one is the the relatively colloquial nature of media and journalism allows for a greater freedom of information and expression. So can these mediums be used to communicate important or controversial science more effectively? And what are your perceived opportunities and limitations, I guess, of using um, a sort of open media? Somebody want to jump in? I, I guess I can just start by saying, yeah, the, I mean, so in terms of using media, ecologists will use media to, to get their perspectives across and to you know, communicate the different strands of evidence that they've accumulated. So it's a, the media is certainly a tool that's used. Um, perhaps the question is whether, uh, well, and certainly the evidence is that uh, many people in ecology and conservation are afraid to use the media because of the their perceived risks associated with that. I don't know, Adrian or Robin, do you want to do you have any other comments on that one? Well, look, so I think it's really important that we can learn to communicate about our disciplines effectively and also about universities and their role in the world effectively. Um, and I think universities are right to value that somewhat. I mean, it's part of my expectations as an academic at the University of Melbourne that is that I, I should be able to do some of that engagement. Um, and I think that, you know, it's both, it's worthwhile for academics to spend some time thinking about how they can do that well. Um, and one of the things that I think we need to do, this is particularly a problem in my field, I think, is to be very careful that we keep within plausible bounds of our expertise. Um, the media just want you to talk on something. Um, and the number of calls I've taken over the last few days about will I please come on a panel and talk about the Queen and the King um, when there's absolutely nothing interesting constitutionally to say about it. 
Um, it's all protocol, and I only know that from watching The Crown. It's nothing to do with the law, right? Um, and I, there's a tendency um, for academics to sort of seek the publicity and to set themselves up as sort of general commentators on public policy. And I think we really need to resist that exactly because, as Robin says, we dilute the currency. Um, I don't take a very narrow sort of view of what the boundaries of disciplines, but I do think we need to ask ourselves, what is really the plausible bounds of my expertise? And if I'm not speaking within it, then don't use the mantle of the university to do it. Just exercise your free speech rights as a citizen, right? Because the mantle of the university ought to be kept for those really special things where we have special reason to be relied upon. Robin, did you want to add to that? Uh, only to reiterate the points that have just been made. We, we wear the, I'm, I'm going to use the metaphor, we wear the curiosity crown, but that doesn't mean we should lose our humility halo, right? And I think that humility is absolutely key. And I think it also extends to the humility and thinking, I'm actually, am I the best person to be invited to comment on these issues? Should I not make way for one of my colleagues who I think would be better placed to inform the public about these issues. But I think it really critically comes down to some fundamental elements of collegiality as well. Mm. Yeah, thanks, that's a good point, Robin. Um, another, another question, uh, I note some of the panel of social scientists, uh, I think we might have covered some of this. Are you exploring similar issues that arise in areas like history, political science, economics, demography, and social change? So as do we see similar sort of science suppressions to what we've been talking about in ecology and conservation today elsewhere? Absolutely. All of those um, uh, ARC projects are in the humanities, mm. um, culture wars all across uh, history. Um, we've got um, pedagogical wars about how to educate children how to read. So all through the, the social sciences. Oh. And certainly there's published stuff in health as well. So health has really been impacted in the same sort of way. Absolutely. In fact, I think the social sciences and particularly the humanities are especially vulnerable. I think they're especially vulnerable because it is actually more difficult to communicate both to governments and to the public mind their value. And because of the intensification of the culture war. You know, I had a very brilliant young colleague with an excellent project, Lusa Decra in uh, what Robbins called the Birmingham 11, and it was just devastating and outrageous and reflected a total misunderstanding of what that project was about. Um, so I think that they, they have their own, their own issues and we need to prosecute them very hard um, in order to ensure that the social sciences and the humanities flourish because they provide a public benefit too. Um, just trying to balance the questions and time now. Um, there was a, Robin, can you quickly deal with, did you see that one coming in on the chat? So it's, uh, it says, so Robin, are you saying oh, that yes. academic freedom of speech now needs a set of rules to allow for oh, okay. S? Yes. Um, short answer, sort of, yes. But also I would elaborate on in the, in the framing of needs, a set of rules. I wouldn't necessarily privilege the law as our only um, arbiter. I think that even in the absence of the law, we can obviously exercise our own standards and um, implement our, our own goals. Having, having said that, of course, it would be lovely to have a wonderful definition. It would be lovely to, to learn from the German um, model and experience. Um, but again, law is words on books, words in books, it's words on paper, unless it's also implemented and lived culturally and given full expression um, in our behaviours and practices institutionally. So I think that all of those things can work together, of course, but we are put at a disadvantage if there is a fundamental misunderstanding of the concept, and then that is the um, that is the the academic freedom that is um, provided for in legislation, which I think is our current circumstance. Yeah. Uh, another two more questions I want to try to get through. One, the first is that academics are attacked and vilified in social media on certain topics, such as trophy hunting, uh, where I guess the conflict is that trophy hunting is a good pathway to conservation, but not so good if you happen to be the animal that turns out to be the trophy. 
So how do you deal with this while standing for an informed viewpoint against internet experts? Um, and how does this endanger the careers funding uh, as we talked about before? Uh, so I, from, from my perspective, I'll, um, you, so long as what, as long as you keep saying what is right, what you know is the, is evidence based, um, and you're clear about what the outcomes are, are that you're aiming for. So for example, in trophy hunting, you say, well, it's probably better that species don't go extinct while some individual animals are killed. Um, then you're on firm ground and, and that's a valid perspective to put. Uh, and uh, we rely in the university system, we rely on our academic freedom policies to protect us from um, pressure from the, you know, the executive within the university. Uh, and so a quick example is that, uh, yes, for, from my talking about feral horses, uh, I ended up with a phone call from someone in the university executive just to say, you know, we had this complaint about you, you know, what's going on? And I just explained what was going on and there was no problem. Um, you know, someone in my position, I, I'm not worried about getting a call from the executive, but you know, if you're an early career researcher or something, you might feel a bit pressured to say, well, maybe I should keep my head down a bit lower. So there are some issues there. But look, I really uh, want to get to this last question. I think it's where we should finish off today. This is, uh, where should efforts to assist in achieving change best be directed? Is this in uni governance or attorneys general or are there other areas? So where should we, where, where are we essentially got to go from here to, to make things better? Uh, who wants to start on that? Let me jump in. I'll just say something quickly because I'm sure Robin's got something to say. We need to focus on all of those levels, right? Mm. We do need to focus on the regulatory contract context. We need to ensure that university governance is properly structured around academic principles. And we also just need day to day as academics in our classrooms with our colleagues to be engendering a respect for an understanding of academic freedom. Um, all of those things need to be done and all of them need to be done pretty much urgently. Yep, Robin. Thank you, I would agree um, all of the above. And I would also hark back to some of the earlier points we made around um, we are contributing to the public good. And so it is to the publics that our message should be mainly directed. And it is in our um, community um, social license in which many of these ultimate objectives, I think, may be best realised. Yeah, and so in terms of progressing academic freedom uh, within universities, I guess this brings us back to our um, PhD opportunity, where, where if, any, if anyone in the audience uh, knows someone who might be interested in uh, doing some research in academic freedom, um, that would be great, because one of the pathways that we can see is to have a firm knowledge base on which to say these are the these are the weaknesses in these academic freedom policies that universities have instigated, and these are the ways we need to try to improve them. Uh, and then it's up to the sort of the societies and the institutes to and the universities themselves to um, to 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 make those changes. So yeah, it's a it's not a short game; it's a relatively long game. But perhaps um, the, and our perspective is over two or three years. We uh, we'll be in a position to say this 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 is the way we need to fill these gaps in in policy uh, so just just uh, to wrap up we've just hit 12. Um, robin any closing thoughts no just to, to thank everyone and just to um you know as a little bit of product placement again uh, the phd application closes the 30th of september so please um do um email um either don or myself and check out the website thank you so much yeah thanks robin adrian thank you it's been a fantastically interesting conversation and um it's really particularly valuable to me to hear how these issues are playing out in your discipline great yes well thanks so much um for contributing Adrian and Robin. Um, thanks everyone for coming along. So we'll, we'll uh, close it off there. And, and if you have any other questions, uh, you can email them through to um, the ESA or, or to me or, or Robin on the PhD. Thanks again and uh, enjoy your lunch, which I'm sure you'll be rushing off to now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.